Hello, everybody. It's our weekly realignment clip here on the Breaking Points YouTube channel. By the way, don't forget to cop that merch. I wear it every once in a while. We've got an excellent clip for all of you today from a great episode. Spencer Ackerman, he's the author of the Forever Wars Substack and of a new book called Reign of Terror. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this one. Yeah, this clip is all about where did the war on terror go wrong? Sucker asked this question pretty early in the episode. A lot of great stuff. So if you enjoy this clip, be sure to, of course, leave a comment. We saw a lot of great debate last week when we were talking about billionaires. So let's bring the same thing to the war on terror. You go to our bookshop and purchase Spencer's book. And most importantly, you can follow the link to the Realignment Podcast, which you can listen to on Apple, Spotify, Google, and our YouTube channel as well. We would appreciate any subscriptions people have. And most importantly, tomorrow is the season premiere of the show. We've brought retired hired Lieutenant General Dan Bolger on the show to talk about his book, Why We Lost. It's all about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So much here. I know everyone's going to kick out of it. Let's get into it. So Spencer, here's where I'm curious. When did the war on terror go wrong? Was it the day we passed the Patriot Act? Was it uh, the, I forget the, I think it was a September or October meeting where Paul Wolfowitz brings up Iraq. Was it December of 2001 when we make the decision not to go after bin Laden and we transition to democracy building and then we transition to Iraq? Like, take us through that timeline and let's contextualize it as much as we can. We have some listeners who weren't even alive on September 11th or were like, one or two years old. So they don't, I mean, like Marshall said, I think I was, so I think I was like fourth eight. grade. Yeah, it was fourth grade Oof. whenever this happened. So like for me, I was watching it on TV. Um, so I was aware these things are happening. The significance didn't become aware until I myself became very interested in the war in Afghanistan and more when I, you know, turned 18, 10 years later. Um, and so you're going back and like re, you know, understanding the events more, but you know, you're a child and then, can, you know, even more so when people who don't even know what's happening and it's literally ancient history. So yeah. Take people through the early days of the war on terror. Where did it go wrong in your view? So I, there is, it's a great question. And there's a lot of stuff there programmatically. I, I will point in a moment to um, certain acts of policy and then acts of strategy uh, that, that go off the rails in direct and material ways. But I think where the war on terror goes wrong is conceptual and fundamentally so. Um, most importantly, this is something that I kind of bring up throughout the book and a theme that I return to again and again is like the ratchet of the war on terror kind of mm -hmm. you know, keeps, keeps turning. But fundamentally, um, on September 14th, uh, Congress passes a 60-word uh, quasi-law known as the authorization to use military force. And the authorization to use military force is supposed to be the document of congressional assent that permits uh, the war to proceed. And when you read those 60 words, uh, the imprecision of them is overwhelming. It's the most present thing in the text. Uh, it provides... Uh, for an enemy, it provides for for actions against an enemy that, crucially, it does not define. It does not limit those operations by time or by space. But there's one really crucial element of the so-called AUMF that is very precise, and that's who gets to decide all of this, and it's very specific when it says the president gets to decide that. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, a very long legacy before 9-11 of the presidency, you know, depending on how you would put it, you know, usurping uh, constitutional powers, constitutionally delineated powers uh, to Congress, um, I would argue as well from the judiciary, and that really shows itself throughout the 9-11 era. But at that moment, a certain threshold is crossed and the presidency in matters of national security, at least, 
kind of becomes an elected king. And the ability to limit the power of that executive, it, it, it's always going to be a tremendous struggle. And this isn't an accident and it's not an imprecision brought upon by you know, the heady days and the panic in the aftermath of the era. It's very deliberate. And architects like John Yu, the former Justice Department official in the Bush administration, talk about this from a matter of principle, that not only are you, know, you and his colleagues trying, Dick Cheney is a, is a very big proponent of this, trying to correct what they see as the erosion of presidential power, but saying that in order to do that, the presidency has to be understood as invested with this overwhelming constitutional authority during times of war that renders those decisions appropriately from the perspective of the Constitution on this theory beyond normal political and legal review. So here we now have an all-powerful president that can define a war against an enemy that he can continuously redefine. That, I think, more than all of the tools that arise after is kind of the fundamental mistake. And one of the reasons it's a fundamental mistake, I'll wrap up, I promise I won't- No, this is good, good. please keep going. I won't belabor belabor your point too much on this, but um, one of the reasons that it's so important to understand that imprecision is that the enemy itself isn't particularly defined like very well ever. And once that happens, it's always going to be a matter of political dispute when someone puts forward the idea that like, well, we've done the job, the war is over. Uh, We did what we came here to do and it's done. Because there are, once you say like the president has the power to define and then, you know, they don't use this word, but functionally avenge, uh, however he or she understands the, uh, the danger posed uh, from terrorism against the United States, it very quickly, you know, moves beyond the people and entities responsible for 9-11 into something far broader. You're always going to have both an ability to, in this country, dispute where the just, where, where the appropriate boundaries of the war are and how and when it ends. And once that happens, you really do have really an endless war. Um, yeah. you, you have that in a way that metaphysically exists kind of outside and before any specific operations, military, intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security um, of that war. And, you know, later in the book, I, I look at, you know, some of the moments when the United States kind of has the choice available to say, well, we did this thing and, and now this is over. And then doesn't. And, you know, most importantly in the book, um, I view and, you know, bring it up as uh, one of the most horrific mistakes of Barack Obama's presidency um, when he's handed an opportunity to kill Osama bin Laden to not say after he's done that it's been 10 years, it's been arduous, it's been awful, but now you know, there's a natural point at which you could argue probably more than any other competing interpretation that with the death of bin Laden, the war on terror is over. And Obama, for a variety of reasons I discuss in the book, explicitly chooses not to do that and to do the opposite. And then we really are kind of unmoored forever in the 9-11. Libya happens that year. So this is, this is where Spencer, here's the problem. You're throwing 15 different fascinating things at us at once. So we're going to pick these in no particular order. Apologies to people who want to follow an outline. To what degree does a president like Obama have the choice to make the statement that you made in the sense that, look, he didn't seek seriously to retain a U.S. military presence in Iraq after the Bush administration and his administration failed to negotiate a status of forces agreement. So the U S was set to leave Iraq anyways, after 2011. Uh, so that was already going that the right direction in terms of withdrawing from that conflict. But then ISIS happens, the Arab spring happens. 
to what degree would Obama making the statement that this war and terror is happening actually lead to the policy outcome you're looking at? Because from my perspective, let's say he gave that speech. And and it's funny, Sagar and I were at George Washington University in 2011. So we were at the White House. Oh, wow. The day. So we yeah. were there, right? We so were like, outside. We were some of the first 200 people outside the White House after so, bin Laden was killed. So, so we remember the energy there. And I entirely understand what you're talking about, where I can imagine a world where the next morning he gives a very Obama lofty rhetoric speech about the war on terror ending. But then the next year, Iraq would have collapsed back into chaos and ISIS would have risen and Syria would continue to escalate. And those same choices would have come up again. So I just want you to talk about the Obama part of that angle. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I brought that question directly um, in the book to Ben Rhodes, who is Obama's you know, probably most uh, aligned uh, foreign policy aide in his brain trust. And you know, his perspective you know, speaks directly to your question that like, come on, like the political consequences of saying the war is over, particularly when there's another you know, terror attack, as there inevitably will be, um, are going to be quite high. I don't diminish that at all. It absolutely would have been the case. Everyone remembers uh, what the political environment that Obama faced was, um, but nevertheless, it was the right thing to do. Nevertheless, the abolition of the war on terror, which Obama never, ever pursues, um, it's a real constraint on him politically but it's always going to be a constraint. And it will always grow as more of a constraint when there aren't political leaders who say, this is over. The way we've responded to 9-11 has made everything worse. If we continue to do that, it will continue to get worse. The standard of there not being another terrorist attack is completely unrealistic. It's also not something that if America, it, it's something that if America is really serious about, it has to look at itself internally and look at what it does in the world. Look at how the overwhelming impact it has on the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people by the fact of it being an imperial power, or if you, if you don't like that term, the hegemonic global power uh, around which what it calls the rules-based international order, a phrase I think is pretty disgusting um, and conceals a lot more than it reveals. Nevertheless, it's the axis around which that whole thing rotates. That's always going to generate resistance. The more violently and less discriminately America acts, which is baked into the war on terror, the more resistance is going to arise. I don't disagree with you at all that if I got what I wanted, and the end of the war on terror happens after bin Laden, ISIS would have still conquered um, Mosul. It would have conquered Raqqa. It would have very likely gone, you know, who knows, perhaps perhaps, you know, further south toward Baghdad. Um, but that can't be viewed outside the context of the war on terror that created ISIS. As long as we stay in this paradigm, We're going to be locked into precisely this binary circumstance in which the reactions make everything worse, but the path dependency is committed to those reactions, that there's no way of getting out. You look at what Biden is doing with allegedly withdrawing from Afghanistan. Yes, the troop withdrawal will happen. But if you listen to General McKenzie, if you listen to Secretary Austin, if you listen to the security apparatus as well as those in the administration and in Congress um, who identify themselves with with that apparatus. They talk about how very willing they will be to continue surveilling and bombing Afghanistan. That is not a departure from the war on terror. That's the war on terror. It's just not pursued at 30,000 feet. It's pursued perhaps more at 10,000 feet, but the wheels on that plane don't touch the ground. And as long as that happens, we're going to be locked into this violent, awful circumstance that kills people and takes away their freedom because the only tools we use here are tools that produce these consequences. And unless leaders have the strength, the wisdom, and the determination to say, I'm going to take this argument on head on in all of its complexity, but without sacrificing a basic moral clarity 
about the relationship between terrorism and counterterrorism. We're just, if, if that doesn't happen, we're just going to be locked into this endlessly. So who is going to really do that? Who is really going to take up that charge?